The story of Jephthah's vow is tragic and unsettling. Jephthah is introduced as the son of a prostitute and a mighty warrior. War breaks out between this people called the Ammonites and Israel. In the midst of this war, Jephthah makes a promise to God. If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return victorious from the Ammonites, shall be the Lord's, to be offered up by me as a burnt offering. The battle ensued. And sure enough, he was victorious. And as he returned home, who is it that should greet him? His daughter. And he broke down crying with regret, as he realized to keep his promise meant sacrificing his only child. And the daughter, she doesn't resist, and encourages him to follow through with his vow. She gets two months to wander the hills with her friends because she was an unmarried virgin. And when she came back, he completed his vow. The story ends by describing an annual tradition in Israel of the women going out to remember Jephthah's daughter. Okay, that's messed up. So why is this crazy story of child sacrifice in the Bible? Most interpretations of this story boil down to one of two possibilities. First, that he did not actually kill his daughter. Instead, she was forced to remain a virgin her whole life, kind of like a nun. In this view, the idea that he sacrificed her comes from a misunderstanding of the burnt offering. The second view is that he did indeed kill his daughter and that there is a lesson to be learned about making rash vows. Let's take a look at that first interpretation. As far as we know, all of the earliest commentary for centuries, from the Jewish historian Josephus to Christian writers like Jerome, unanimously interpreted Jephthah to have sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering. In the Middle Ages, some commentators started to feel uncomfortable with the idea of human sacrifice in the Bible, and so they found new ways to read the text. Abraham ibn Ezra was the first to suggest that the daughter was sacrificed by keeping her holy and pure, thus she remained a virgin her entire life. Some of the reasons these commentators gave for this are, one, there is a strong emphasis on her virginity in the story, and it would be kind of weird for Israel to have a national day over a child being sacrificed. Second, child sacrifice was a crime in the Bible, yet Jephthah is never explicitly punished or condemned. Finally, the phrase used in Jephthah's vow meaning burnt offering comes from the root word Allah, which means to go up. And so it's argued that it's been misunderstood in this context. He was setting his daughter aside for God. You can understand why people would want to rescue the Bible from this uncomfortable story. There are several major problems with this theory though. The first being that this idea only developed in the Middle Ages. All of the earliest commentators interpreted it as human sacrifice. The later interpretation coincided with the growth of the number of women participating in monasteries and secluded monastic life in medieval Europe. The second problem is that while the Hebrew word does come from a root verb that means to go up, when used as a noun in the Bible, it always refers to a burnt offering. The history or origin of a word doesn't dictate its meaning. The way to determine what a word means is to look at its use in as many different contexts as possible. When looking at this noun, ola, in Hebrew, there are hundreds of other examples to look at, and they all refer to a burnt offering. So it would seem that when the text says Jephthah kept his vow, the ancient audience understood that he really had sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering. So then, what's the point of this gruesome tale? Why did Jephthah even make such an irresponsible promise in the first place? Whoever comes out of the door to greet me, I will sacrifice? What was he expecting, a pet sheep? Well, that is actually what some have argued. The particular word Jephthah used in his vow translates literally, the one that comes out. Could it have been an animal he was hoping for? The vast majority of the time that wording is used in this way, it refers to people, but there are a few occasions where it refers to an inanimate object. So there is a small chance that Jephthah was thinking of an animal, but it was more likely a person. 
After all, he would have known that it was customary in Israel for women to come out and greet victorious male warriors with a song and dance. One scholar has argued that Jephthah was actually expecting a family member to come out, and that's why he made the vow. You see, in the world of judges, honor was like a social currency. Jephthah was the lowly son of a prostitute, and so honor did not come to him naturally. Victory in battle would have given him honor. For this reason, perhaps he was thinking he would have to sacrifice one of his children. The costliest sacrifice brings the highest honor. And so it would seem that the story is deliberately disturbing. It's over the top, almost to the point of being absurd. But as with many of the stories in Judges, that's kind of the point. Horrible, absurd things happen all the time in the book of Judges to make a point about the path that Israel was on. For the ancient audience, there are clues in the book that it was about the dangers of life when each person does what is right in their own eyes. Jephthah's vow was not a heroic moment to be imitated, but a lesson to be avoided. At the beginning of Judges 11, Jephthah shows off his diplomatic skills, managing to become an army chief, even though he was the lowly son of a prostitute. If you only read the first half of the story, it's about a nobody who makes a success of his life. And just as the audience is expecting great things from Jephthah, he leaves behind his clever bargaining skills and makes his rash vow. The foolishness of his vow is highlighted through its painful consequences. One thing a lot of readers find unsettling is how willing the daughter is to go along with it all. She comforts him and then encourages him to follow through with his vow on the condition that she gets a few months in the hills with her friends to mourn her virginity. The truth is we don't really know why she does this. Most scholars suggest it was to present Jephthah's daughter as more pious and morally superior to her father. It's probably also another example of the story being over the top and absurd to drive home the warning to its ancient readers. The annual memorial was probably included to explain a real tradition that Israelite women held. Wait a second though. If Jephthah was such a bad role model, why is he listed in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith? The guy who sacrificed his own daughter as an example of having faith. A couple of things can be said about this. First, this view of Jephthah as a man of faith was not the only view in the first century. Josephus also wrote at the end of the first century, around the same time the book of Hebrews was written. He criticized Jephthah's rash vow and said that the sacrifice was neither conformable to the law nor acceptable to God. So the ancient audience were probably aware that Jephthah was no simple hero. Secondly, there's other questionable characters from the book of Judges in the list of the men of faith. The author appears to be focusing only on their military achievements and their faith in God in battle, rather than making a moral judgment on their whole character. After all, victory in battle was seen as a sign of God's favor. Kind of like how in 1 Samuel 12, 11, the author highlights Jephthah's military victory and how it allowed the people to live in safety. Also, nearly all of the figures mentioned in Hebrews 11 did at least one thing that was contrary to Old Testament law. But we'll have to unpack that more in a future video. Finally, it seems like the summary at the end of Hebrews 11 contains some traditions that might not be from the Bible. For instance, he mentions that some of the heroes of faith were sawn in two. Who was sawn in two? There's an ancient tradition that the prophet Isaiah was killed by being sawn in two, but that's not in the Bible. It's possible that this section included some non-biblical traditions about some of these figures that were familiar to the ancient Jewish audience that we no longer have access to. So just because Jephthah was praised for his military success in one instance doesn't take away the message of warning to the audience in this story in Judges. The truth is, this story, like many of the stories in Judges, is ambiguous. It leaves the work of moral judgment to the audience. The story resists attempts to give it a simple meaning. Several scholars have pointed out that the treatment of women in particular is a measuring stick in Judges, an indicator of the kind of political and social path that the society described in the book was headed on. It's an uncomfortable story, but one that is fairly obvious should not be imitated. 
making rash vows and then foolishly following them through to the point of killing one's own daughter is terrible and was not an example to be followed. The lack of an explicit condemnation of Jephthah is not a sign that the author endorses his behavior, rather the ambiguity invites reflection and moral judgment on the part of the audience. Thanks for watching, my name's Lachlan and if you enjoyed that video, leave a comment and share the video with someone. And thanks to our channel members who help make videos like this possible. If you want to help us make more videos like this, consider joining, links below.